there's a chat. And so when we look at the vetting module, what we have here is, um, as I said, it's very extensive, but because that's the reason for that is because we've actually given you access to how we, um, how we actually vet. Uh, things here at Scribe, right? So um, right at the very top, you'll see like uh, for a preliminary vet, just for when you're originally looking at your at your files, you'll see that um, there's a couple questions to consider. And this sort of connects to what we were talking about towards the end of our accessibility talk, right? Like what is the scope of the project? That's something that you want to ask right at the beginning. Like how far is this project going to go? Um, you know, this question for us often um, includes whether, you know, this project is going to get an ebook or if this project is going to, you know, be, you know, typeset only or, or, you know, are we just copy editing it or are we just composing it or whatever it might be. Um, but in your case, you know, you're going to take this all the way towards, um, you know, that SCML ebook stage. So uh, that is already answered. But once you ask that question, it sort of brings up other questions. Okay, so what is going to, um, like what goes into getting the project towards um, that point, right? And then here we actually um, sort of tailored this a little bit towards um, towards you guys and said, you know, like like well, how much of this is going to be handled, how much of the project is going to be handled by, um, you know, somebody in-house uh, and how much of it's going to be handled by Scribe or another vendor. Um, you want to ask yourself that at the beginning because then that way you can already reach out and for example, if we are going to be receiving a manuscript here at Scribe um, for a composition and copy editing or whatever it might be, we already have it on our radar and we can place it into our schedules. Uh, you always want to, like, again, sort of that thing that I said that I was going to hammer in throughout the classes, um, which is that idea that, you know, if you fix things in the front end, you know, the back end, sort of everything sort of falls into place. Um, Right, and so uh, from that here on in, then you'll see that each um, section, right, and we're just gonna skip through this just a little bit, um, each step um, in the well-formed document workflow has its own vetting. Sometimes you don't have the answer to these questions right at the beginning, uh, but it is always good to review the file with sort of the big picture in mind uh, before you get, um, you know, actually started on the work, right? Um, and you'll see that because of the fact that we don't, sometimes we um, tailor things for when, um, you know, a project comes in midway through the workflow rather than, you know, right from the beginning, you'll see that um, some of the things like files will repeat, right? And so you won't need to necessarily go over um, that all over again. So here in the word composition bet, you'll have questions like, are all files present? Like, for example, did your author send you all chapters or you know, is chapter four, chapter five, and six missing, right? Things that you need to consider um, right from the beginning. Like, do all the files open? This might seem like something redundant or something like so simple, um, but imagine you're working on something, you didn't open up all the files, and all of a sudden, chapter four doesn't open, it's corrupt. Um, Word, for example, corrupts files all the time, you know, power outages, things like that, something got stopped mid-save, um, whatever the case might be. So it's always good to open up all the files, make sure you have everything and that everything is accessible um, to you, right? And then um, make sure that the author actually sent you, you know, what they said they sent you, right? That's what that question, do the files contain um, the content uh, that the file names indicate. Uh, sometimes, you know, authors will rearrange chapters and they'll say chapter two in the file name, but that's really chapter three, right? And then you have to um, clear that out. And as you can see, most of the other questions are uh, set up in a similar manner. Like, so they might seem simple, but they lead towards like, oh, okay, this is why um, I'm doing this. And so vetting should take a good portion of your time right at the beginning. You should take time with the project, especially if what you're receiving from the author is something that they're considering a um, um, final manuscript, right? Uh, if they're sending it to you and they're saying, hey, I'm not looking at this again until the editorial stage, you should be spending time with it. If you cut time while you're vetting as a project manager, what you're going to end up doing is causing more problems for yourself in the end. Um, so, it might seem like, wow, I'm spending, you know, an hour looking at this file and, you know, everything seems okay. I'm just going to keep going. I wouldn't do that. Um, that, you know, that results in a lot of issues. Um, 
So it's always good to take into account like, hey, I'm doing all this work now, so I don't have to do that again um, later. And so I brought up before we went on break um, this idea that if you don't feel comfortable, for example, down here for the copy editing vet, right, the editorial vet, let's say you're not an editor and you don't know like, hey, you know, what kind, what level of editing is required, for example. Um, this would be a, a good moment to then consider what options you have and say, okay, I may not be an editor, but I have somebody on my team who is, give the file to them and say, hey, look, I need you to look at this file, go through this list, look at this, see anything else that pops out at you and note that for me so that way I know, you know, I'll have that uh, information available. Um, this is important because for example, when you're working on um, on the editorial portion, something and I'm just focusing on that just because that's where my area of expertise lies, right? Um, you might look at a manuscript and chapter one looks great because it's the first one or the introduction. You know, authors tend to do that. They'll work like really hard and really focused on, you know, that first, those first couple of chapters. But about halfway through, you know, the quality may degrade a little bit or towards the end where the author just wants to get it done. Like, and I, and I don't say that in an insulting way. I say that as, as a human being, I think all of us get to a point where we're working on a project, working long enough that towards the end, we're just like, I just need this out the door. Right. Or I got deadline looming or whatever it might be. And that's, um, if you don't have an editorial eye, you may not catch that because you're saying, Oh, chapters one through three were great. Um, and, I looked at chapter five and it was fine. But somebody who does have an editorial, I will say, hey, wait a second. You know, this author started misplacing commas here and all this other stuff. This might indicate something bigger. Um, at this point, like I said, it's always good to see what options you have. And again, you know, if you need us to look at something for you, you know, we're more than welcome to, you're more than welcome to send something our way and say, hey, like, for our opinion. Uh, Kathy has been doing that while uh, working on the composition of her chemistry book, right? She sent stuff and said, hey, look, this looks like a sidebar, but I don't know if there might be another option. Hey, you know, that's a very good question to ask. It doesn't take us very long to look at it. Um, but if you want us to do a full vet, you know, then we're also available um, to do that as well and sort of give you the information and say, hey, look, this is how long we think this is going to take. Um, and I don't know, Tim, if you wanted to add anything about like typesetting, vetting, anything specific, since I always send that stuff to you and you just give me information. So the most I can do is kind of echo what you have been saying is that you don't have to be an expert in every single one of these things, mm -hmm. because just like with, you know, all this kind of typesetting and design, that's to me. And I look them over and respond with a different notes. Hey, I think this is going to be tough or oh, this whole chapter is uh, in German. Well, you know, is somebody going to check the line breaks in that because the typesetter might not understand what they're actually typesetting if it's in a different language. Um, and similarly, I send stuff to our editors to review. Um, so having someone with some expertise or overall view of what this process is like is going to be very helpful because they're going to be able to plan and catch issues a lot more. Um, and if you are just sort of if I were to look at something and, you know, I, I, it's going to go to copy editing, or maybe let's say it's not going to go to copy editing, I'm not going to catch that. Maybe chapter one's notes are formatted and CMS and chapter two was written by a different author and they use ALA or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, I don't have an academic or editorial background. It's not something I will catch. And then if we catch that later on in the process, it could add a lot more time versus catching it early because I sent it to someone who had expertise in this area and they're going to look at it. Uh, me as the project manager, I'm just going to get everybody's notes together. Um, oftentimes this will come with estimates. I think this will take 40 hours. I think this will take eight hours. And then we get a, a sort of beginning sense of what the time investment is going to be like for this project. And so that's why you see that this vetting module is like so in depth, right? It's so that you have a good idea of what's going on. But as Tim said, if you, it's almost like a team effort. If you have the people, use them, right? If you have the resources, use them, right? And um, and again, I'll, I'll, heart, I'll heart on this, but, um, you know, we are also available to, to help uh, in that um, area. So you'll see that the, as I'm scrolling through, this actually goes down and even goes into images, which was something that we discussed while we were talking about accessibility, making sure that our images are correct, that, you know, here, for example, do we have permissions, right? Are they CC BY, which is what you should be sticking to, right? Um, 
all of this takes place right at the beginning, right? So if we're thinking about it almost like a workflow, we said we've received the manuscript, we've planned sort of how we're gonna get everything, and now we're actually looking at the manuscript to make sure that everything um, fits and that everything is as it should be, right? So you'll see that you'll have questions like what format are the images in? Did the author send you like PNGs, GIFs, and God knows how many other uh, formats? Or do they send you everything as JPEG? Are they the right resolution? Um, so on and so forth. Um, I don't know, Tim, if you wanted to see some, let's say something. Yeah, um, just I, when you said that it was kind of a community effort, mm -hmm. um, it made me think that one of the best things about going through this process is that you may not necessarily always come up with answers for all of these questions, but it might raise questions that will then inform your approach going on mm -hmm. or bring up things that you have a discussion with your author about. Um, I think that if you're not quite sure, uh, well, is this going to be treated as a, a standard element like we saw with the example, you know, Kathy's author was including these elements that we thought could maybe be repeated throughout if you're vetting it early on, you might have the opportunity to say, hey, author, we kind of think we're seeing this structure in your book. Can you, do you agree? Is that a problem? Is that going to be okay? We're going to move forward with this plan, et cetera. So it, much of this is meant to raise questions so that you can look at the entire project and develop a strategy for how you're going to handle everything. And so, and that's why, um, like to use that as a jumping off point. That's why we have, um, you know, we go all the way down to ebook, you know, and we say, okay, what is required? What do you need? Um, and as a project manager, you have to think that way. And I'm sure that you, you guys having worked in like with massive projects and having already uh, published some books, as, as we saw from the introductions, you know how difficult it is to sort of, sort of think in the big picture, but at the same time, think about these little details that can be, um, that can, you know, truly destroy uh, a project or blow up its time or blow up a uh, budget. Um, and as Tim was saying, like these questions um, that, you know, we're having you ask yourself sort of bring up ideas that maybe you weren't thinking of um, just because you weren't thinking about it, like towards all the way towards the end or anything like that. So yeah, I see Tim. Um, I yeah, I, I just wanted to say that it does seem like this can be a very long, sort of boring and question-filled part of the process because you may just have a list of questions to come up with. But to try to suggest to everybody that you know, avoiding this notion that sometimes comes up of, well, this should be enough to get you started. Or I'm going to, well, this chapter is done and we're still working on the other ones. So use this and get started with it. You might start making decisions based on that small sample size and then you see the rest of the book and suddenly the structure could be different or tons of other issues could be raised all of a sudden once you get to the full extent of it. Um, I'll be forward and say that we've had projects in the past that's happened where we received text that was finalized, but then authors go in and they want to change things. And it becomes kind of apparent that so they're like writing this book in page proofs. This is still happening. This content wasn't solidified. And really what you want to say is like, well, we shouldn't have even started typesetting this book because these decisions and conventions are still up in the air and it's just causing the corrections time and the typesetting time to go up, up hugely. So it's one of those things where we want to make sure everything's as final as possible before going from one stage to the next. So we're not going to be introducing all these new elements or changing where things are placed or the order of them in typesetting because once things are kind of locked down into that design stage, then it becomes much more problematic to move them around. Unlike if we're in Word or if we're just doing electronic only, we can kind of move things around. So um, some of the things where it seems like it's, it can be kind of a bummer to say, well, I don't think we should move on yet. This isn't quite established, but it can save you a lot of headaches going forward because you'll know that you can just go full bore into something after it's been properly vetted and approved and move on from one stage to another. All right. And as a project manager, you should feel comfortable enough to say to and this is why you would have established like some relationship with your author um you should be comfortable enough to say hey we can't get started on this until you finish that chapter we can't get started on this until you know we have all these images in and if they ask why because you've already gone 
through this vetting procedure, you're saying, oh, because if we do this later on, that's going to just cause problems for us, right? Um, as Tim has said, we, like we, and being forward, like we've dealt with, with things where like they're still being written and it's already typeset. And it's like, oh boy, you know, at that point, you know, it's whatever time you save by starting with like whatever pieces you had has gone out the window. Um, so never think that you're, as I guess a best practice, never think that you are saving time by skipping over something and saying, well, I'll handle that later. If you can handle it now, handle it now because it'll save you the headache in the end. Um, I see Carla saying an emphatic yes. She's speaking from experience. I'm sorry if it gives you night terrors or something <laughs> remembering that experience. Um, be the beast. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. better to handle that. Go ahead, Tim. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a, a good model because you do kind of feel like a bad guy sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, you want things to move forward and you want to be able to talk to um, everyone else working on the project and say, yep, we're moving forward. Things are progressing really mm -hmm. wonderfully. But then if you're sort of like, it's, al it's almost like you're moving forward into a cactus patch or something like mm -hmm. that. You, know, you, you could just be hitting all these obstacles and hitting all these problems you know, for the sake of forward progress. Yeah. yeah. And there's there's this idea that, you know, sometimes we think, and, and maybe it works this way in academia, um, you guys would be, um, would be the better ones to tell me if this is true, but it's this idea that we have to move forward and we have to keep going and that's, and we have to give that status update that says, you know, hey, everything's going great. Sometimes the status update is like, hey, we haven't stepped into the next stage because we still aren't done here. Um, and that's actually okay. I think that as a, um, as a project manager, that's not a bad status update to, to give, to say, hey, look, we haven't done this because I'm still working on this part or I'm still getting this, you know, done and making it like as perfect now before we move it on to something else. Yeah, it could be a bad analogy, but it's almost like if you're baking and you're trying to save time by not cracking your eggs into something else, you just throw them in and you're going to pick out the shells later. Yeah. Um, that's how it is sometimes if you're working on a project that is just going to generate tons and tons and tons of corrections in the future, you know, you would want to do it the correct way first so that you don't even generate those problems later on. It's a hard lesson to learn to rush into something and then all that time you saved, right, is now gone because you spent it doing corrections or all that stuff. I've had that happen and that's not fun. So um, I like Tim's analogy. I think it works. So <laughs> don't, like crack your eggs before you throw them into the mix. So when we're thinking about betting, again, it might seem tedious, it might seem long, or it might seem like, hey, this is holding things up, but it actually isn't. Um, it's always good to be methodical and mindful of what you're doing at all stages, but especially in the beginning when you're, you know, getting everything ready, getting everything set to move into uh, the next stage. Um, so, uh, does anybody have any questions about bettings or any comments? Like maybe you've had experiences where like having had like a checklist like this would have saved, saved some time. Like if you could share that, that'd be great. 